Okay. Goeie ja, morgen allemaal. Ja, ik wil het weer hoor. Goeie morgen allemaal. Dat is ons is in die karoe. Ons praat vlot Afrikaans. Even if you can't understand what I'm saying, you can, you can try. And I know we have somebody from Brazil here who, only sp who speaks Portuguese and not Afrikaans, but you can still say, Goeie Moura. <laughs> and welcome to the Rural Health Conference 2022. My name is Steve Reed, and I am identify as a rural family physician. Yeah, somebody from um, yeah, but I'm currently working for my sins at UCT uh, as head of primary health care. And I've been part of the organizing committee, part of the, uh, uh, chairing the scientific committee, and relying very heavily on a, a hardworking group of people to bring this conference together. What an amazing venue. Uh, this is, it feels like somebody's getting married. And I'm wondering who that could be. You know, like we needed that sort of, here comes the bride music, you know, as, as people came in. So, um, uh, the, I wanted to just introduce the, the theme of the conference this year, learning, adapting, and thriving. For many of us, this is the first time we've seen each other for, for three or four years. Certainly for the scientific committee, I've never met some of the people face to face at all. We've had endless Zoom meetings uh, organizing the, the program, and I'm meeting people first time face to face, and I'm sure that's the same for all of you. What an amazing venue. We are the guests of Matilda and Albertus uh, in this beautiful place, and uh, they have gone beyond expectation to make this venue a welcoming one for all of us. So thank you, Matilda. There she hiding. There she's hiding behind there. And I'm sure you'll see her uh, busy with a lot of, a lot of different uh, aspects of the conference. But without further ado, we've got a busy plenary session now. And um, uh, Herman, who is the main conference, organizer will be giving you some more logistic details at the end of the talks, but I do want to start with the formal welcomes, and the first of those is to the uh, Oatshuan community, and it's from the executive mayor, Chris McPherson, who's uh, with us for uh, an hour or so this morning, so Chris, please. Oops. Obrigado, as they would say. At least that's the one word I know. Um, thank you, Chair. I am truly today humbled to be in the presence of such distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Myself and millions of others would most probably not have been here today if it hadn't been for your dedicated profession. And that's a fact. COVID-19 made us mortal beings realize the invaluable contribution you make to ensure not just our well-being, but our mere existence as well. Thank you from every single one of us. I don't think we've said thank you more than enough. And today I want to emphasize that. In this regard, I want to extend our gratitude by honoring you with the freedom of our town for the period of your stay here. This can mean I can go for years on the street and to the end and say that you are now the one of these geëerde leden wat nou vandag hier is. For the time you're going to spend here in our beautiful town, welcome to the ostrich capital of the world. And may I say, and that's why you see all these feathers here, that's just a, a quick reminder. But on the other hand, I also want to say that, um, as my Australian mate would say, maybe after Saturday we will know more after the international rugby game. They usually say, oh, it's the arse stretch capital of the world. <laughs> but uh, and that, I, I must say, we will see Saturday what we're going to stretch. But in any case, please feel free to partake in all our 
fantastic venues that we have here and there are events that we have in Oatswirm. I want to extend an invitation to you to visit our Kangal Caves, our iconic Kangal Caves. And my staff will be here. You will see some of them already here. And even from our tourism sector will be here to assist you if you want to visit, if you have some time available. I know, as the chair said, that Steve said, there's going to be, it's going to be a, a rather packed program. But for those that want to extend your stay, please go for game drives. It's close at hand uh, and other visits to other venues at the same time. And while you're here, and I'm in this presence, I want to ask a favor, if I may. I want you to see if you can find a remedy or even a cure for politics. <laughs> I say politics, poly means all, and ticks. You all know it's that little bloodsucker. <laughs> so if you can find a cure for that, I'll be very happy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your conference and enjoy your stay. I'll be seeing you tonight at the Bri again. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, I'm not sure what the what the freedom of Otswin actually means. Does it mean we can carry a ostrich feather, uh, put it on our aerial, or? <laughs> so I wanted to. Um, just talk about the the conference theme in a bit more detail um those of us who've worked in rural areas or are working in rural areas um know about adapting uh you've got to make a plan because there's no backup and when things go wrong or things go uh not how you expect it well you've just got to shift to plan b and that's always the delight of these conferences is because nothing ever quite goes according to plan but we're amongst friends here who understand this thing. And so when this big thing called COVID came along and we had to adapt big time and patients couldn't come to our health facilities and it all seemed chaos for a little while, I think that the rural uh, health workers were ahead of the rest. We're used to the thing when the water goes out or the electricity doesn't work or the, you know, the lab worker uh, who's supposed to do the lab tests in the middle of the night had too much to drink last night or whatever. Um, so the, the conference team adapting, learning, adapting and thriving, we thought was, would take us uh, forward uh, towards uh, the, the idea of thriving and um, from my own experience of, of rural practice, it's really a place to thrive. It's a place where we can uh, really be our best selves and make, make a huge difference to the communities that we, that we work in. So that's just some of the thinking behind the theme. I hope that you'll hear some inspiring talks uh, uh, throughout the conference that speak to that theme. But I'd like to introduce our next speaker who is uh, uh, Dr. Lizette Phillips, who's, who um, is the Chief Director for Rural Health Services in the Western Cape. And uh, Lizette served as the Director of the Cape Winelands District, which is um, further towards Cape Town, for the past 13 years. And just since the end of last year, she's promoted to the position of Chief Director, Rural Health Services. And as I pointed out to her, she's the only a uh, civil servant in the country with the title, with the phrase in, in, the type, in her position title of rural health. So she's at the right place. <laughs> but um, just some background, uh, she was in private practice and joined the department in 2003 uh, at Brevelskloof in, in Worcester and then became the medical superintendent there. But she has a keen interest in child health and as well as TB. And uh, <clears throat> she's organized a number of different uh, interventions in the area of TB. Uh, she's on the provincial consultative task team on drug resistant TB and um, uh, helped Bravel's Cliff to become an antiretroviral treatment site when TB and ARVs uh, uh, came together finally. Um, 
She's got qualifications from UWC, from University of Natal, from the Colleges of Medicine and, and UCT, and she's currently pursuing her Master's in Public Health at UCT. And her, her passion is to establish seamless care pathways, equitable access, and the highest standards of care in rural health services and beyond. Um, we have asked Lizette to formally open the conference. So, over to you, Lizette. Good morning. Uh, good morning. And thanks, Steve, for that um, wonderful welcome and Mayor McPherson. Um, so one of the things they, they coach you about um, when you live a hectic life, like we do in public health, is to pause, to breathe, and to take in the moment. And, you know, this is such a wonderful opportunity for me to be part of. I would have loved to be here for the whole conference because it's like Steve said, rural is my home. Um, and went many routes and returned um, yeah, around to 1999, actually worked a bit in even Donges back in the days before I went into private practice and realized mm -mm, so hard to ask people for money to pay for health services when they can't afford it. I will never <laughs> survive in private practice. And I followed my heart, and that is what I've been pursuing all along. And I'm so privileged to stand here this um, morning um, to be part. And I'm humbled to be have asked to open this conference. Um, and I think Steve made me a bit nervous because he told me that this morning. And remember, you must declare the conference open. It sounds so heavy. I said, wow, isn't that the mayor's job? But nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> so, so colleagues, um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. It would have been Dr. Keith Kluter, but nevertheless, uh, the dice fell on me. And I hope that I can give you some insight in, into rural health services and, and a vision um, for rural health services, obviously aligned with the departmental vision. So, um, but before I start, I want to acknowledge my team because I've been out of practice actually for the last two weeks being overseas with, with Steve and, and company at the um, uh, Conference Towards Unity for Health in Vancouver, um, connecting up with the Rural um, Coordinating Center in British Columbia, making connections again, looking for opportunities for us here in, in the Western Cape, and came back very sick last week. Um, and, and the team, I just want to acknowledge my office team who has done the groundwork in terms of getting uh, a presentation together. Uh, and I've just put final touches to it yesterday. So um, I'm going to dive in. And I know Steve is going to watch me, or who's the timekeeper. So colleagues, um, OK, down. So it's changed. The slides are changed. OK. So there are three parts to my presentation. Pardon me if I don't pause too long in the first part, because I think the presentations will be available, Steve, afterwards, uh, where I will contextualize Otsuera in, in the rural health services in the Western Cape for you. The second part, they've asked me to talk about this heavy philosophical concept called distributive justice. So I did search, but since this is not an academic lecture, I will not dive into um, all of those definitions and it's a simple thing of uh, uh, apportioning equal resources to those who are in need and I hope I will um, be able to speak to that a bit and contextualize again um, what we are trying to do in the Western Cape. And the last bit uh, Steve also asked that I reflect a bit on our experience in the Western Cape on COVID, our um, system response, what have we learned and how we can take forward some of those learnings and obviously a lot of this is work, very much work in progress. Okay, so I hope you can see that um, you are, you know, Western Cape, one of nine provinces, um, and specifically Western Cape, um, you know, um, specifically we are like, uh, in terms of surface areas, we're the fourth largest um, province. 
um, population wise in the Western Cape, 7.2 million people about, uh, and may I please, the data sources differ slightly from what the municipal data sources are. Um, but in, if you take up uh, um, the rural health services, specifically the rural areas, we are about 2.4 million um, people. Um, and yeah, uh, there's a lot of detail there, but maybe just to say that we have um, six um, districts, one being the metropolitan area, city of Cape Town, and then the other five districts, rural districts, are obviously um, listed there. It's Cape Town and Central Karoo, Garden Road, over the West Coast. And Garden Road is, uh, and Central Karoo is managed by one district manager. Um, and then importantly, since we are talking about NHI and improving, you know, uh, implementing universal health coverage uh, of note, that about 75% of our population is uninsured. And uh, this is just a, a, a map to show you uh, more visually our um, health uh, facilities. Um, I thought I'll just give you quickly an idea. You can see the red dots, uh, round dots are clinics. The district hospitals are the light uh, green ones. And then we have three regional hospitals who provide a package of general um, specialist care. So in total, in the rural health services, we have 281 primary health care facilities, which contribute to a headcount of around 5 million um, people. We have about 86 mobiles, 55 satellite clinics, 124 clinics, 15 community day centers, and one community health center. Um, 25 district hospitals um, with a, a total of 1,361 beds, three general hospitals with a total of 881 beds, four TB hospitals with a total of 483 beds and obviously distributed, maybe not equally, uh, equitably, but they are, okay, it's moving. There are different referral pathways to ensure access to, to specialist care and beyond the rural setting. So this is just a map to show you more or less. Um, uh, we are now obviously in Garden Route with the seven uh, municip municipal areas, uh, and we are in Oatswara. And um, since recently, Oatswood and Kanaland has become one management entity with the management manager of Oatswood and also taking responsibility for Kanaland in terms of governance. Um, I think there is you do, you can read. And yeah, here's just the contextualized Oatswood and sub district um, with um, uh, the towns of the rest, they sort of open Oatswood. Um, having about 93,000 people, a third highest population in the garden route. Um, and yeah, in the different um, age bands in the population, which always guide as a our system response in, in terms of the service delivery package. Um, and, and even the Otsuran is here, far away from our uh, central and tertiary services in the metro in specialized psychiatric services in the metro, there is a clear referral pathways um, and a partnership with EMS and the Alphanet to ensure that our patients, even though they are far from those centers, that they access care. And obviously we all understand there's a burden of disease and what feeds that burden of disease in public health relates to social determinants of health. So it's important for us to understand what would be um, uh, the social determinants in this context and how unemployment or low literacy levels actually feed into people's understanding of the disease conditions and the contributing factors in taking ownership um, also for their own health. So, um, and, and also and seemingly mayor is not doing too bad uh, in terms of providing uh, up, um, a, a water, pipe water, refuse removals and flush toilets uh, with electrical lighting also available. This is a very interesting slide. I've been around for 16 years in public health management and I have actually seen and experienced the epidemiological transition from infectious diseases. Uh, leading to um, natural causes of death 
where there's always been uh, a competition between TB and HIV for the first place. And what we are witnessing and experiencing is non-communicable diseases, um, the transition, and, and we, uh, and the clinicians in the room will certainly tell you um, the pressures of chronic care um, that they have to face uh, on a daily basis. Um, and it does ask for a rethink and a, and a system redesign going forward. There's lots of details in the next two slides um, about the performance indicators specifically related to the Otsur and Sub district. Um, I, you know, my personal reflection were, were twofold um, last night when I went through this PowerPoint. Um, first, I, I looked at Otsur and Hospital, and it, and, and it is the biggest district hospital in the rural, and there's lots of, of activity in, in this hospital. And the thing that caught my eye was actually not just um, the inpatient load, but, but also the, if, the impact on the emergency center. Uh, this data is for 2021, 22. Please contextualize this. It's in the pandemic, uh, around the third and the fourth wave. Um, and, and look at the surgical output, despite this, the pressure of this pandemic. Um, but the thing that, the second thing that I want to highlight is there's always this perception that everything came to a standstill during the pandemic. And this is to show you that, you know, that heroic efforts by, by our staff and, and teams uh, at facility level, uh, for me, it makes me so proud to be leading a team that despite all of that mayhem um, in a crisis situation and a disaster management situation, they try to deliver and provide equitable access in a difficult situation for routine health service. So well done, Dr. Dreyer and team. Um, this, I might just want to just, uh, again, a lot of information here in the same year, 21, 22. Um, the one of the things we've experienced recently is the, uh, a really a massive pediatric season from November until May, uh, where we have really experienced a, a high um, admission load with pneumonias, kids less than five years, pneumonias, um, diarrhea yeah. with dehydration and um, malnutrition. And you can see here, uh, it's pointed out. And we all know that uh, the COVID period didn't only result, unfortunately, in devastating uh, lives lost, um, that, that devastation, but also economic loss. And we all know about the economic impact that it had and in the impact on food security and malnutrition. So there you go. So this is the bit I want to come to. Um, I think let me take you quickly. So I've been in this position for eight months. So don't be too too quiet with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I think coming from a rural district, uh, obviously that serves as a benefit to the team because I have the background of working and managing in the public health system. So one of the things that I've experienced and the frustrations as a district manager is that we want the health system, but we've got different programs. So yes, the clinics and there's the hospitals and then there's regional hospitals and there's TB hospitals and then there's psychiatric hospitals. But there's one patient with multiple needs requiring um, a, a service response that will address that needs and make sure if the patient needs to, when he enters a care pathway, if he needs to move from this district hospital to the specialist hospital, he needs to move. And we need to be very sensitive of any system barriers and get rid of it. You'll see in my slides, uh, the next slide. So what I've tried to introduce since I've been appointed <laughs> and people are still chewing on that bit, but it's gonna stay, is that, is that y'all's you sector management in a geographic space must take co-responsibility for the population health of the population in that geographic area, Finnish and club. And we have issues then we need to sort it out. So what you've seen here is the rural districts, uh, you know, according to law, we follow the district, the municipal boundaries, uh, but what I want to change is this next slide. Is that we link a geographic, um, the, the, the teams in a geographic space with that drainage, regional hospital drainage area. 
So we, uh, what we coined uh, now is the Palo Hospital ecosystem, the Booster Hospital ecosystem, the George Hospital ecosystem, and we have started the process to learn to work together. That is like a great challenge, but nevertheless, we'll get there. We'll get there. There's really more and more we're talking about it, uh, understanding. So what David and Yanni in my office did, they did this beautiful slide to give you an idea what the health service encounters would be in the average rural ecosystem. So I'm going to go quickly. So you started with those three um, ecosystems. You have a regional hospital. That's a daily encounter, so about 93 admissions. And it's averaged out. It's not one specific um, ecosystem now. You'll have a TB hospital there, which is about two admissions. And that's asked for a response that we have seen. Whereas we have decentralized drug resistant TB. Uh, change our, our regimens that our TB hospitals are not so busy anymore. So we are already chewing on that one as to how we can utilize TB hospitals better to speak to the needs of people. So I'm just going to go quickly, colleagues. I don't have much time. And this will give, I've got five minutes left. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so, so now you can see this. So this is um, the visioning process I started in, in February, uh, January, February. And I, and I speak to maybe just to show you that we, this is our vision. We want to get the rural, healthy rural population. Um, we really want to improve interconnectedness in the system so that we provide seamless care to our patients. This is pre-COVID, our transformation journey towards Yalke 2030. And I just want to tell you the thing that gripped me and that I made my personal motto is the leadership pledge that we are committed to do the greatest good for the greatest number creating the greatest value for all, with special considerations for the vulnerable. And that would mean there are vulnerable populations in the rural that I am responsible uh, for with the team to improve access to our care. This is a slide that I love. I use it in all my presentation, even for the interview for this job, to demonstrate that uh, there's a difference in, in, in handing out equal resources to everybody. There the boxes are the same. They still don't see across that barrier. And then we go, but more to uh, equity, but there's still a barrier. So this is where I want to get to the last slide. I don't know how this point to work, by the way. But the way we remove system barriers, and I alluded to it earlier on. So the department is currently busy to move away from historic budget allocation. An exciting project, but also very nerve-wracking. And we're using a risk-adjusted uh, methodology where we consider age and sex, multiple deprivation, sparsity, and premature mortality, and how we're going to shift funding to where it's needed. Very exciting. We're busy with the number crunching. I love what I'm seeing, but we can't effect massive shift. It has to be an incremental process. We don't want to shock the system. Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. And obviously the vulnerable populations in the rural are our farming community. And there's a whole lot of stuff happening there. Uh, I'm not going to speak in the detail of that. Suffice to say that because I haven't had much time in the first eight months, the next thing is to have a conversation with the Department of Agriculture. I'm doing mapping on, on what is currently already happening and how we can strengthen that and improve access to our clear beyond mobile services to our um, farming community. Um, I, I, that's a lovely picture. I love it. It is Tankwa Karua and Madeleine Bauer is here. You can ask her about our outreach to Tankwa Karua and a wonderful, right. wonderful um, uh, opportunity to provide access to people wherever they are, where they come with donkey cars or whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. We go where they are. Um, I'm going to skip this. It's too much detail. And you all know about community primary care approach. We just had a workshop, a rural workshop yesterday, wanting to cement that concept and see how going forward, as we redesign to respond to health needs, that we partner with the community wherever they are. And then just to mention that we have a, um, a partnership with the Department of Education, taking buses to our primary schools, the poorer communities, package of care, looking prevention, eye care, eye screening, um, um, hearing and um, our big challenge, the burden of, of, of oral dental disease. We're busy with the 10 year review. Alice, the two in my office is busy with it and we'll see how we can review and take this forward. So lastly, I, I beautiful graphic 
uh, but devastating effects, not just on the health services, but also on our communities, COVID-19. Um, and we are currently busy with the triple service burden because we integrated that COVID vaccine co co uh, in our services. And we also try to strengthen um, our core health services. I don't know, it's a bad reflect. I'm not gonna go in detail because Steve is looking at me. Okay, he said, no, it's fine, fine, fine. Um, there are many lessons that we have learned and I'm sure you can uh, identify with some of it and you might have from wherever you were in the health system at that particular time, you might add to it and we can learn from each other. But one of the things for us in the Western Cape was that staff matter. You know, employee wellness, we talk about it and talk about it. And I take my hats off to the leadership of this department who has shown that you can flatten our governance structures in this pandemic via virtual communication and connection to and be connected with the frontline people. You know, the people in the trenches that is making this department looking good and to connect with them and, and to make sure that, that, that we learn from them. The collapse was a wonderful experience. You sit there sometimes and you can't, you choke in your emotions when you listen to um, facility managers sharing their journey in the COVID pandemic and you know this, we are all in this together. That sense was was profound, uh, profoundly evident all the time. And the HOD directly engaging um, with the top management team. We had formal healing sessions contracted uh, from external to, because we all were traumatized, um, seeing colleagues die, seeing our, our patients die, family died. It was a profound loss that we experienced individually and collectively during this pandemic and uh, we needed healing. Um, I think, um, I, yeah, lots of wonderful stuff uh, about how we centralize our communications, single messaging with decentralized communication offices pertaining to the COVID pandemic, pertaining to the vaccine strategy. And we wanna take that learning now as we address um, the social determinants of health and make sure that we educate our communities and that we have a single messaging on on, um, on those aspects. And obviously we have a work from our policy now because we can work in certain situations. I think the issue about partnerships, I can't, you know, when you're in the rural, um, we were always resource limited, but we're so resourceful. And there's, there's a, I can give you a whole lecture and, and, and share almost two hours with our experience prior to the uh, uh, COVID where we've established intersectoral um, partnerships with local municipalities, with district municipalities, our sister partners in, um, in education and social development. A lot of that happened at district level. Um, and how in COVID we could just phone a friend, you know, we could just re uh, reconnect. Um, and obviously those, uh, the external engagement um, with our partners um, has led to a strategy where the provincial government uh, now is looking at safety and security. And there's a violence prevention unit that will be established or has already been uh, established in the Department of Health at the strategic level with local area-based teams that will work across government sectors, uh, hopefully with communities. This is a bit that we need to get right and we are struggling, let's be honest about that. But we wanna get that right. Um, and yeah, tomorrow is the big workshop where we're all gonna come together and sub up as to how our different departments gonna work uh, to improve safety and security and, and reduce the violence levels in our communities. Um, innovation, I'm not gonna go to that. Wonderful stuff that we explored with that work in COVID that we wanna take forward. Um, and I think for me last, the social mobilization. Um, how do we truly partner, and it links to the partnerships um, with all the stakeholders in the geographic space to work a collectively uh, common goal and, and, and common purpose. And we've had internal and external uh, engagements led by the HOD, supported by the MEC, to see how can we get to a point where everybody takes responsibility for health and, uh, and get the understanding that the way we live uh, has an influence on our uh, disease burden. I'm not gonna touch on that, my time is up, but we have a strategic framework to redesign the services. I've touched on some of it already. Um, 
And this is the product of the internal and external engagement with the department and external partners. And this depicts our transformation journey going forward uh, towards 2030, uh, how we show up, uh, what do we do, and what we aspire to become in a values-based um, context. Thank you. Must I say the magic words? Yes, I feel so honored to declare the conference open. <laughs> thank you. Bye, thank you. Uh, phew, the conference is open. <laughs> <laughs> but there you've heard a very eloquent introduction to rural health services from uh, from a manager who's really got that you can hear the background and the experience and the understanding of what it takes to manage people who are dispersed across vast areas of the Karua. Um, and uh, and that take some doing you've noticed the use of data here and i must say you know the western cape government really takes data very seriously you know what are we basing our decisions on i myself was part of the the COVID response in cape town when we took over the 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 conference center the ctcc oh my word that was what an incredible experience so we'll have a chance to discuss that uh, through the conference but i need to move on um, you know, you might wonder why we're not meeting in Otsuan itself and why we have to drive 15 kilometers out of Otsuan. It's, it's to do with this definition of what is rural. Uh, so one of the definitions is the distance from KFC. <laughs> so I'm hoping 15 kilometers is enough to qualify as rural. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Mayara Floss, who's come all the way from Brazil uh, as a representative of WONCA, which stands for the World Organization of National Colleges and Associations of Family Practitioners. Um, she's a Brazilian family doctor, a writer, a poet, a filmmaker, and a health activist. She's currently a PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo, and she previously worked as a Science Without Borders Fellow at the National University of Ireland in Galway, a period in which she discovered rural health as a student in the Connemara fields under the supervision of Dr. Edward Harty. She developed a number of projects to raise the awareness of rural health care issues, creating Wonka's Rural Seeds Network, which we'll experience for ourselves this afternoon, and co created and coordinated the Rural Seeds Cafe, Mentor Mentee, Rural Health Success Stories, and Rural Videos. Uh, her energy never stops, and she was part of the steering and review group of WHO guideline on rural health workforce, attraction, recruitment, and retention. She's uh, an author of the policy brief recommendations for Brazil of Lancet Countdown 2018 and 2019, also a member of the Planetary Health Group and Advanced Studies Institute at the same university. She's spoken on rural women's health at the United Nations in 2018, and it's an honor to have Mayara with us today. She's probably exhausted as we've had her on an intense work schedule for the last two weeks, but Mayara, the floor is yours. Where are you? There you are. <laughs> Thank you for the nice introduction, Steve. And it's amazing to see all of this together, you know. Uh, I just, just, yeah, a short person, you know. Okay, can you hear me well? Okay. So it's been such a journey the last few days, and I know some faces here which been bringing me all around South Africa in the last days. And it's been amazing. I have been in the last 10 days meeting the rural uh, facilities, the rural universities, and I have been 
very welcome from with all of you it's been very special for myself i can't do the the thing to say the name of all of people that I need to personally thank you, but I will in name of Stephanie from Rudaza and Longi to say thank you to you also, please. Uh, thank you so much for receiving me and for showing all, all that you are have that you have been doing. So I have this task to talk about the rural health in Brazil. And uh, I was thinking a lot in the last days, and I have been changing my, my this this lecture every single day when I see something here and I say maybe this that we do in Brazil will be helpful. So I have been working a lot to make like a nice presentation that can bring some inputs, and I'm very happy to say that we'll be all today here. Tomorrow I'm leaving back to Brazil because I need to start to go back to my primary care work on Monday. So. Um, Please have a chat if you want to, to discover a little bit more about it. So here we go. Uh, yeah, I just want us to remember, uh, this is from a um, movie from Brazil called Out of Breath, was a doctor that went to record all around Brazil, how was working the, our Brazilian health SUS, uh, system, our national coverage system. So how hard was to cross Amazon rivers and how hard was to be in remote rural areas and prisons and all the places that we have our primary care uh, work working and um, and what we have been doing to being an uh, integrated system. Uh, I will bring you the ideas and many things that works, but it's not perfect for sure. It still have a lot of things that we need to improve, but just for you to, to give a little bit of the, the idea. And I can't start without saying how huge is the challenge and how huge is the challenge for rural. We have 65% of the world population has received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. But then when we talk about low income countries, just 15. And uh, I think it's really interesting that we start to connect between the global South more because we have so many things that we share and we also have very, the struggles, many of the struggles are really the same. And I can't start without also remembering us that we are in a war world and that we are in the 21st century and we have climate change and we have so many things to face and we still have war. So I can't start without uh, mentioning it, this and trying to remember us uh, how privileged also we are here to having vaccine and not using masks and all of this. So I just want us to, to like talk with our hearts how lucky we are. And uh, I want to, to just for I starting and that we are all in the same place, I want to show you this video that we have produced with Rural Seeds. I did the script of it and some of the editions. And uh, it is about recruitment and retention. So just have a look on that and then we move it. It's very short. I need sound. Yeah. Or, yeah. Well, oh, no. Why do we need rural health workers? Did you know that almost half of the world population lives in rural areas? This includes populations that live near rivers, in forests, deserts, islands, mountainous regions, and other remote areas. Eight out of 10 people living in extreme poverty live in a rural area. More than half of the people living in these areas are without adequate access to essential health services. Yet, rural health 
and access to health services are often neglected in analyses of health status and health system performance. Universal health coverage cannot be achieved without a well-trained, motivated and supported rural health workforce. Addressing the maldistribution of health workers in countries is key to addressing the pervasive inequity in access to health services in rural areas. So, what can be done? Within a primary health care approach, health workforce policies and strategies play an important role in not only ensuring better health outcomes, but also in driving community engagement, gender equality, and sustainable economic development. There is a clear need for a whole of society approach to develop, attract, recruit, and retain health workers in rural and remote areas. We must invest in development and training of multidisciplinary fit for purpose rural health teams. Enrolling students with a rural background in health workers education programs, bringing students in health worker education programs to rural and remote communities, having health education facilities located in rural areas, and aligning their education with rural health needs. We must protect and support the existing rural health workforce by giving them decent conditions to live and work with access to continuing education, professional development, and attractive career pathways. It is also important to recognize the contribution of this workforce, to guarantee and ensure health lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. We need to have policies to develop, attract, recruit and retain health workers adapted to the unique realities of rural and remote areas. The newly updated WHO guideline on health workforce development, attraction, recruitment, and retention in rural and remote areas offers a broad view of what can be done to achieve the global principle behind the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and to leave no one behind. So let's think and act in rural areas together. So that's what I want for us, that we think together uh, also as a global community. Just check. Oops. Yeah. So I decided to, to yeah, well, okay. So I decided uh, to bring uh, my traditional food from Brazil, which is beans and rice to share a little bit with you and to talk about access because sometimes we make things so complicated and look beans and rice it's very easy and I know that you eat here as well so uh, we can do good things and keep things simple so that's one of the things that I want us to reflect and at the end of the day what we want we want that we have this beautiful universal coverage of the health system. So we want that everybody has access, not just to health, because health determinants are not just about accessing health. It would be much easier if you just say that people just need to have a healthcare facility with health professionals, but they need to have food. They need to have water. They need to, this is the health determinants. It's not just about, um, Access. So I will be talking a little bit about access to basic health needs or needs of being humans. We need a roof, we need a house, and all of this as well. Anyway, so just because people sometimes um, do not know the size of Brazil, I just want to show you how big it is. Australia fits in Brazil. We have a population of 200 million, and um, oh, it's eight. 0.5 million kilo, half, uh, square kilometers uh, and 47% of South America. So imagine a health system that covers the whole country. It's very challenging. And this is the challenges that we are dealing with since 90s. So uh, just for us in a rural perspective, 60% of the Brazilian municipalities are considered rural. So 76% of our population are located in rural. So what I'm going to talk here is really about like how to do this healthcare integrated in a public health system. 
system. So this is the car after a home visit that I have done. So just to show you like how and it was completely clean, clean when I when I started the home visit and how it finished at the end of the day. So our health system is called SUS. I will use this word, so SUS, the Brazilian Unified Health System. And I think we have too much to share between our countries because we are both from the global south. So I just want to, to bring you, uh, strange, okay. So the Brazilian health system started with a major, huge health sector reform that was driven by civil society. This is one of the things that is very important. We need to, to have uh, the involvement, not just of health professionals, but we need the involvement of the civil society. And uh, the SUS was instituted in 1988, and it was on the principle, principle of health as citizen right and a state of duty. So the uh, primary health care covers over 70%, and the SUS covers 99% of the Brazilian territory, which is massive if you see the, 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 the size of the country. So just for us, I think it's important to have a little bit of an idea. Sorry about these boring historical things, but I think it's important. Uh, we had a, a military dictatorship in 1954. We have 1985, the Democracy Instituted. And then we have a sanitary movement that we have like public health professionals working to and with communities, which created uh, the National Conference of health and which stated the principles of this healthcare system. So what are the principles? Because always when I'm in doubt, when I'm doing my work, I always come back to the principles. I'm doing this, why? And it, am I like, wh why I'm doing these things and then kind of helps. We have the citizenship constitution and uh, in 1988, we have like the plan how it would work. 91, we have the national program of community health workers, which is awesome. And uh, it's very interesting based on territory. So each health worker will have, community health worker will have a territory assigned to them. We have then the family health program that is where the family doctors stays. And then we have the primary care policy in 2006. And we have like the supportive much professional family health teams, which composed by uh, social care workers and um, psychologists, physios, and what is needed for each community. And uh, we have the creation of the More Doctors program. And in, two, in 2016, political crisis. So we started talking about politics when we start in the opening here with the crease. So I think this has been very hard for myself, a young doctor, I hope it's still a young doctor, uh, to, <laughs> to be in, in, in having these constraints. And then we have the COVID and the COVID was showing like, how we need the health system working. So I will show you a lot of beautiful things, but I must say that political crisis being massive and destructive for my country. And it started like people not liking politics, so they don't want to talk about that, but then anyone got us in the power and then we have like this far right uh, president uh, that's been horrible. So we have loose uh, Cuban doctors that were working in the More Doctors program, and they, they created another program, More Doctors for Brazil, but a far right oriented program, and which we lose coverage from our health system, which is very sad. And of course, 2020, we have the COVID pandemic, and we have been showed how was important to have our health system public as a matter of right, and not as a market issue for all the people in Brazil. So just for you to have an idea, roughly idea, how we have been reducing with this primary health care uh, implementation. So we have increased the breastfeeding uh, of the woman. So from uh, 2.5 months in 70s to 14 months in 2006, we have reduced the stroke mortality. We have um, uh, reduced the children mortality. And uh, 
we have also like reduced, uh, we have covered, so it starts with like being a fairness. So the primary care starts to uh, covering the, the poorer areas. So we always start where the poor are, and then we go to other places uh, to advance the, 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 the coverage. And we have so uh, in the last decades, increased so much the primary health clinics. We have like over now, I think I have checked the numbers yesterday, we have over 50,000 primary health care clinics. Every primary health care clinic, we have a health team, I will show you um, soon. And uh, we still have the challenge of the private sector, which wants to make money from the health. So this is one of the things that we have been struggling a lot to, uh, that they do not destroy this awesome public health systems that reach our poor people. And, and not just, it's not just about the poor people. We want to have a health system good for all. So uh, we don't have other interests in the in, and other drivers in this in the system that is not just being healthy and making people health. So we have the basic principles in our, in our hand: universality, it is for all; integrality. So we do not work as a pyramid; we work as a network, which is really important. So we don't have a primary care and then secondary care, tertiary care. I will show you some examples how it is. Um, a network thing. We have equity and decentralization and social participation. I will focus in decentralization and social participation and a little bit of integrality. And they would need uh, some more hours to be talking for of all the principles. But when I'm doubt, I'm always back to the principles. So I will share some things that we can learn from SUS. There is the community health workers, the social participation, more doctors program, and the tele -saudi. So how it works? I have, myself, I have a team that we are in the community that we care. Uh, I care for around, around 2,500 people. And then we have like a primary care facility, which hosts uh, six health teams. And each team has a physician, a nurse, a, a, usually a family physician, and then a nurse assistant and community health care workers. And every two teams, we have an oral health program, which has a dentist and a dentist assistant. So this is how we work. And we have been like every community that has around 5,000 or uh, 10,000 people, we have one of these. So I personally know how many pregnant women uh, I have. I know exactly the numbers of how many people are in hypertension drugs and how when they came to the facility for the last time. I know all the diabetes people. I know how many tuberculosis, how many HIV. And I manage as a family doctor all of this. And we have the NASFI, which is a supportive team for social work, psychologists, physiotherapists, and other members, according to the necessity for each three to four health teams, we have this supportive. This is one of the things that the, this horrible government is trying to cut. So the NASP teams, which has been like a huge loss for us, but we are like, uh, we are trying to maintain us, ourselves resilient. So I think resilience is one of the things, I think maybe almost a principle for us to, to keep doing the work that we are doing. So just for you to understand a little bit more how the community health workers works. So we have the GP and nurse, and then we have the community health workers that covered like uh, a little bit of the, of the territory. So each one will have a number of houses. And then they visit these houses like frequently. So uh, they are, I always say that they are my eyes in the community. So uh, they know exactly if there is some, uh, some violence, violence happening, they will tell me, doctor, there is a, we have an issue in that house. Can we make home visits? Can we do anything with the social worker? We have a, a guy that's coughing too much. I think we you should do a TB test or something. So they are our eyes in the community and they visit always the same place. So, and this reduces the pressure in like 
the primary care, but also in the hospitals and all things. So we try to work in, in reducing the pressure for hospitals and trying to hold the things on primary care and secondary care, avoiding the, the hospital uh, referrals. And just for you, show you like how it works. So we have like, this is the ACS is the community health worker. So which one cover a region? and uh, how many people live in that region, that, that's a rural area. So we have many because the distance were so hu huge that we need to have more healthcare workers to cover it. And they know everything. They have like a bicycle and they go to, to the places and, and visit people. And uh, so this is myself talking with them about air pollution and uh, and to, they are recruited from their own communities and are usually young and female. And uh, they are really special people. I think I can't even think about working in my, in where I work without them. And this is one of the other things that being treated by the actual government. So, and then the next thing that we have is the local health councils made driven by the civil society and the healthcare workers. So for instance, we need to have some action or we need to have something at our place. We need to have more health personnel. We, we share it with the community and we have meetings like monthly meetings and then they go to the health municipality as a community with the, the healthcare workers to try to say look we have we pay our our taxes we have a constitution that says that we have the right to health and it's not happening well so we need to make it work so this is how it works and i will show you so just to share with you a little bit of the how it is a system. So this is how the mental uh, care network works. So we have the primary care and then we have like a special places and that is, is sustained all over the country with a psychosocial strategic care, which I can refer with psychologists, psychiatrists, and we try to avoid as much as possible hospitals, but if needed, we can do uh, the hospital care. And then we have the emergency care. And then we have like, all this transitional home care and things to try to maintain the person in the community, avoiding taboos or this kind of things, and trying to work as a network. Same for urgency care. So we have like uh, home care and uh, we have surveillance working and we have our primary care, but then we have the ambulance service, which is also, it needs to work very well because we are majority rural. So we, and it's public and, uh, uh, it's a matter of the state to make it work. So it makes, because you cannot feel like um, safe or secure as a, a primary care worker if you can't have an ambulance that will respond like quick enough to, to come and get a patient or all of this. So, and it's integrated in the public. So it works very consistently all around the country. Yeah, sure. And uh, so we have, just to show you a bit, I will not go through this, uh, so we have the social participation and executive bodies and inter-managerial uh, committees. So the social participation is key to make it work. So we have people participating in all decisions. So this is very important. So we have our municipal health councils, which is uh, fulfilled by the regional and the, the primary care councils that I was, showing, that I was showing to you. And then we have the state health council and the national health council. And they meet time by time all together. So uh, this was crucial for us in the answering of the, the COVID. Even we didn't have we have everything to have a very good response, but we have the wrong president. So he was saying, yeah, sure. So he was saying, don't use masks. And then we were saying, use masks. It was like a very, gosh, it was, uh, it was like a schizo thing that was happening like uh, uh, in the communication, you know. So, but we had everything and I think we did quite well with the fake news that were running uh, around. 
So this is just to show you that it's possible to uh, get uh, more uh, 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 a better coverage. We have this more doctors program that has proven that, that worked beautifully and was completely destroyed by now. They, we, I don't have the data to show how it is now, but I'm sure that looks like 2011. So what this program wants, they wanted like a doctor for every uh, community. So every community of 2,000, 3,000, or 5,000 people will, would have a doctor and a team, a nurse, community health workers to work as this. And uh, this is a very interesting. I will not go through all of that, but I just want to make you curious so you can research by yourselves and, and, and see more about it. But it is possible to, to, it is possible to give good health care in rural areas. So, and I want to share with you this is one of the last points about the telesaúde, telehealth that we have, because and then I realized here this when I was here, I have been talking with many uh, young doctors or, and rural doctors, family doctors that are quite isolated. So we have a hotline that we can call at any time and talk with many spe specialists. So other family doctors, but we can also talk with, oh, I'm doubt about something, anything like a dermatological skin, a skin lesion. Can I talk with a dermatologist? So then they, the dermatologist will talk with us at the hotline and in 20 minutes, probably we have sorted out, or if it is something very, very serious, they will say, we will call you later, but do this for now, and then later we can do something. This is a very interesting idea. I, from January uh, 2014 to 2021, more than 240,000 teleconsultations were answered, and the uh, uh, referrals were avoided by 62%. So it's huge. Uh, I was talking with Ilungi that you need to know that. So, so to, to try to have ideas here to avoid referrals and try to solve things, we have this idea that as much as we solve in primary care, better for the system. So we avoid hospitals, we avoid uh, hospitalizations and this kind of stuff. And uh, we have more than 32,000 teleconsultants answered in rural areas. So that's a lot. And um, but we are living in political environment and economical crisis, and this is not just for Brazil. It's a world crisis for sure. But just for us to make aware that, for us to be careful and care of our democracies, because I'm a, we are about to have elections in two months. I'm sure that you're not, maybe not that interested in Brazilian uh, politics, but just to share how hard it is to, to, to be a family physician there. And I'm also an activist, so uh, it's very sad that we are seeing our rights being like threatened. And um, I just want you to, to, to know about that. And uh, we have uh, the child mortality is raising again. Uh, we have been treating the achievement of the SDGs, and uh, we have been heavily issues on budgets and finance, private sector, then it's raising because we are getting more like weak as a public sector, which is a very sad. And uh, we have still issues on recruitment and rotation, and the determinants of health has been horrible because people are being pushed to the poverty line and hungry again. And also we have climate change, which is a new layer. So we talk very briefly. And I can't, um, I can't talk anything without saying that we have lost, lost almost now by now 700,000 deaths by due COVID. So that's very sad for our country and for the system that was so beautiful and structured to have such a bad uh, president. It's so sad. And, and the maternal mortality rose 77% in the last two years. And hungry. So it's such hard to be a human in this world, you know, like, and being, seeing the construction and the falling down of the, of the health system. And, you know, COVID, uh, we need to protect our, um, our indigenous communities and all the knowledge that they have. 
So it's so sad to be living in a necropolitical time. And I do really hope that all the time that we say that the economy is more important, is like saying that the ship matters more than the crew. So we need to take care of the crew and the ship. And I just want to share you uh, one uh, tiny video, one minute video. Uh, I have been working a lot on planetary health, climate change. I want to do a super invitation for you. And I almost finishing, Steve, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> this sound. Nutritionist, community health worker. To dear health professional. I presume that you always want to be the best for your patients. But have you ever thought that maybe you are missing something? When your patient has an acute cardiovascular disease, have you considered the air pollution that he or she is exposed to? Have you checked the temperature of that day? We live on a planet that has changed a lot because of humans. Even COVID is related either to our food production chain or it is worsening when the air pollution levels are higher. Is your patient depressed or feeling hopeless? Mental health can also be related to how we inhabit Earth. Talking about climate change is urgent. We cannot miss things when caring for our patients. Planetary health studies how human health is impacted by global environmental changes. Learn more at the Planetary Health for Primary Care course, available for free and with certification. Do not miss things when taking care of your patients and be a part of taking care of our planet. So I have been working, uh, coordinating this course completely, basically voluntarily in my free time that I don't have. <laughs> but I just want to push you, I, I couldn't uh, finish it without inviting you and saying that we are doing amazing work to try to say that we need to talk about climate change at all possible time that we have, because we don't have a plan B, we are not going to Mars. So we need to live now. And it's not for the future, it's happening now. You have like the rain bomb in Durban, you have draw Cape Town some years ago was almost without water. So that's an issue for now. And it is an issue for health. And uh, you can do the course. Uh, it's free. You can uh, just, if you write down, it's very easy to, to find on Google. Uh, I can make the slides available as well. And uh, well, I was thinking how to finish my talk today. And then I was remembering that Steve have a very nice course on arts. And I was just thinking and I decided to share a draft poem, it's not completely finished, of my days in South Africa. So this is a little bit of my gift for you and to say thank you and uh, hope to come again and see you again and hope you visit also Brazil. And I think we have too much to learn, share with each other and that we should like work for that and we should uh, global, why we are not talking about climate change in global south? There is interest on that. Because who suffers more the consequence? Who is putting more carbon? It's not us. But we need to adapt. We need to mitigate. And we need to get prepared for that. And we need to have universal health coverage. And you are all part of this. So thank you so much for having myself. I read my poem, and I'm sorry, finishing. <laughs> so it's called South Africa. The hands of wind, modeling time, carving trees, flying myself all around, rural and beyond. Climate change cut my skin, blowing my ears. And your infinite hands, wind, playing with clouds, blessing rains, 
but, but also carrying pollution, pesticide and drought. By the unbalanced human life and spreading seeds, little bits of hope. And we, humanity, are part, windy, turning, going viral, sculpting and caring to find balance and remember that we are part of nature. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Mayara. What a fantastic uh, uh, international perspective of rural health. Um, Stephanie, who has uh, helped to bring Mayara here, is on Zoom. Most of you will have interacted with her in registering for the conference. So, uh, Stephanie, are you available to speak? Um, yes, I am. It's just, it's just for the online people. Um, for your CPD points, we just need to do some regular checks. And we're going to do that by poll. And if I'm lucky, here's your first poll. So if you just click, can you see the poll? I've only done this once before. So, okay, fine. People are answering. That's great. And we know that you're connecting all right. I don't think there's only a couple of us online at the moment. Great. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I needed. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. While you're there, I just want to say thank you for all the organizing that you've done behind the scenes. Yes, every year I keep saying I'm not going to do it. <laughs> We really appreciate it. Um, everybody here has has interacted with you in one or other way. I'm um, sorry you couldn't be here in person, but thank you. Um, just to finish off uh, on Brazil, every time I've been there, and I've been there a number of times, I come back inspired, absolutely inspired, that it's possible to have a health system that reaches 98% of the population. What did you say? Uh, with not much more, more resources than we have in South Africa, uh, a similar level of, of GDP per capita, or however you want to measure it, um, that, that it is possible despite, sorry, Chris, despite the politicians. Um, yeah, if we had a solution for you, I'd, I'd share it with you, but we don't. The, the cure, the what, you know, the cure for politics. <laughs> uh, because we have our own, you know, political challenges in this country, as you might have gathered. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that this conference represents something of uh, what can happen at grassroots level if we catch hold of that hope and that inspiration and the possibility uh, at, at a, a local level, at a district level, at a primary healthcare level, we can really make the difference despite what the politicians do with the money. Um, to move on, our last speaker this morning uh, is a, a, a dear colleague of many, many years. Uh, Professor Yogi has been at the Walter Sisulu University, uh, previous head of family medicine. She's a family physician who's worked in the Eastern Cape uh, health system for the last 35 years. She's worked in different contexts in primary health care, in community health centers, district hospitals, and regional hospitals as a specialist family physician. And she was one of the founding members of the family medicine department at Walter Sisulu. She recently retired from her position as academic head of department of family medicine uh, at Walter Sisulu. Uh, but retains a, a contract with the hospital. She's passionate about designing and implementing educational programs for health professionals in the rural context of South Africa. And she was one of the task team members that uh, first implemented the clinical associate program in South Africa. Uh, and she's here as a guest of PACASA. Uh, and we've specifically asked her to speak uh, in the opening ceremony because uh, we want to have the discussion about clinical associates and their place in the rural uh, health 
system in a province which has not accepted clinical associates. Uh, and so we we kind of deliberately set the set up that tension uh, in this first session because uh, we want to have that discussion. Western Cape, what's the story? You know, um, and and what are the, what are the reasons uh, for for not um, uh, accepting clinical associates? But I hope you'll lead lead us in that discussion, Yogi. Um, around the career progression and the challenges that clinical associates have, have faced and are facing uh, and bring us up to date. So we really look forward to what you have to say to us. So please welcome Professor Yogi Yogeswara. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think let me clarify what Steve said earlier, the definition of rural. Uh, the time of uh, Kentucky and uh, rural is gone because uh, last year my interns, um, when I asked when they were trying to choose their the community service hospitals, when I asked what about rural in their definition, if a place doesn't have Woolworth food, <laughs> it's considered rural. <laughs> Times are changing, so that's the mindset. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak on uh, about clinical associate program. I thought before uh, I talk about the program, maybe I should take out two confusing issues which are generally uh, played out when we talk about clinical associates. And uh, what I thought is uh, one of the issues we have is among health workers ourselves, um, many of us are not clear who are these clinical associates, what do they do? Can we trust them? Can they do this? Is it allowed? Because it's relatively a new profession in the health sector. Um, our understanding actually impacts of their contribution to our health system in this country. So the, the first thing I thought we must all kind of look at is that uh, if I say doctor, all over the world, everybody understands who is a doctor. If I say a clinical associate in Malaysia, they would say, ah, because it doesn't make any connection. So when we look at the title for the card, which does the, have the same job uh, description, in similar job description in across the world, they have different names. That's our first problem. As you can see, physician assistants in USA, clinical associates in South Africa, clinical officers in many of the sub-Saharan African countries, assistant medical officers towards Asian countries, assistant medical practitioners, and there are many more, uh, including a Russian title for that as well. So our understanding is less, it's not because we don't see it as an issue of the world, but because we don't link the different names when we come across, we are talking and seeing the same uh, uh, clinical health workers. But one thing to, again, uh, to look at, the second issue is there is a perception generally, uh, this is a mid-level medical worker, so maybe it's for poor countries or developing countries where there is no facilities. It's a, it's a perception people have. I, I would like to actually sort of remind ourselves, uh, this is not true, because um, if you look at this map, I've tried to put uh, most of the countries on the map where mid-level health medical workers are in the health systems contributing to the health services a huge numbers in United States and some other countries in the American continent. And then in Africa, as you can see, there are a lot of countries. The interesting part is the Europe. 
and uh, going to Australia, New Zealand, these countries have embraced mid-level medical workers only after 2000. In this century is where they realize in the first world, not in the third world, in the first world, to, con to deliver healthcare, mid-level health medical workers are important and they are embracing it. They are opening up training, they are opening up training schools and that's how the current trend is. There's a, a table I would like people to have a look at and see this study was done on mid-level medical workers who are called either physician assistants or physician associates. So it, it limits itself to only 18 countries. But I think what I would like people to just have a look at and the year where this program, they, they, they have first getting their graduates to work in the numbers, but as well as since when they have got their uh, clinical associate program. I'll use the term clinical associate because that's what we have it here, but it implies in this one to the entire world. As you can see, the first world has started besides uh, generally USA, the rest of the Europe and uh, Australia, New Zealand, they are actually getting into only after 2000 and actually moving forward. And so we at South Africa, we are in power with them. We started our programs during that time. So what I would like to do following this is to just to acknowledge, appreciate what clinical associates have been doing in this country. I think we have 11 cohorts of clinical associate graduated since 2010, and their contribution is probably not recognized and appreciated enough to give credit. I think that's what I'm trying to look at and say, how we can share that information to see what they can do, how they have been contributing to us so that we can make future decision based on that. So to look at clinical associate, the mid level medical workers, it comes or starts from the, some critical issues affecting our country. Obviously the most unequal country in the world, those who have and have not. We have a huge quadruple burden of diseases, maternal and child mortality. We are trying, we are really not there, and we are near where we would like to be. Non-communicable diseases just growing in numbers. Violence, injuries, and trauma, we don't have to really expand on that. HIV, AIDS, TB, and, and so on, infectious diseases. We have the highest number of people living with HIV in this country, in the world. We have the biggest HIV treatment program in the world. For this to happen, the programs to succeed, we need hands. We need hands to do that. And we will see how clinical associates have been contributing in that space. So to top on the existing burden, we had this experience of the COVID pandemic in the last two years. All these are in a country where our health system is having a huge shortage of healthcare workers. And it is not only healthcare workers in numbers for the country, but it is in a country where the health system itself is skewed. It's skewed because the private and public sector, they are two different worlds. The rural and the urban there are two different worlds, right? So we all are very much aware, the majority of uh, the workers, healthier workers are in the cities where there are workers, probably, and metropoles, and we have for, uh, only 12% of the medical doctors uh, working in rural areas, where we have about 40 odd percentage of the population. So that is where we come from as a, just a one or two things to note here. With that context of those issues, we still need to, we are walking towards or we are aspiring to get 
universal health care to all our citizens in South Africa. By 2030, we are expecting that we are going to achieve that. And that needs hands, health workers. And that needs, we need to increase the efficiency of the system to be able to achieve that. And to be able to have quality health care given through health workers who are trained in a way who can offer that. So as part of this, during our first pandemic, at least in our lifetime, which in, the, in our memory, the HIV time, we all learned tasks shifting for the first time. We were reading definitions when we started having HIV, how to manage, how we were able to move tasks from doctor-based to nurses very, very successfully. And we are in a time again now, we have a big goal to achieve in 2030 for every citizens to have that benefit. And we also have experience with HIV, we learned a lot. And it's time to put it in practice for the future. So just to understand who is a health or uh, clinical uh, uh, associate or what is this profession mean? It's a mid-level medical worker in medical cadre in terms of the health workers. And then it's, it, they, they are trained for three years, getting a three-year degree, with, which is called Bachelor of Clinical Medical Practice or ba Bachelor of Medicine in Clinical Practice. Started in 2008 in South Africa, and then the first cohort graduated in 2010 from WSU and the uh, WIT and UP, they started in 2009. So we have 11 cohorts of graduates in this program who are currently contributing into the health system. Currently, we are training about 150 clinical associates in the three universities and uh, roughly about 1,500 1, graduates are in the country from this program. This program, although I have mentioned the first cohort graduated in 2010, started working in 2011, the actual scope of practice was published by the Minister of Health in 2016. And that was a period where People were worried, are they legitimate? Are they legal? Uh, what about this? What about that? A lot of confusion set in at that time because there is a cadre of health workers who don't have a published legal scope of practice. But luckily, that was done. But I don't think all of us moved from that embracing the, uh, the, the uh, scope of practice and change our mindset towards this profession. The curriculum designed very quickly. Again, when the curriculum was designed for a clinical associate, the objective was very clear. We are preparing or developing or carry, uh, 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 graduates who are going to function in the primary health care and district health system. Therefore, the skills and knowledge they needed to get during the, that three years were planned accordingly. They were expected to give promotive, preventive, curative, and palliative care. And whatever procedures, clinical skills they needed in a district hospital level, they were trained on. They were trained to manage illnesses and disease which are common in the country which included consultation, counseling, clinical procedures, pharmacotherapy, and surgical assistance. They are trained to manage emergency conditions. And they are training, most of their training of the three years took place in district hospital in all three universities. Therefore, from first year onwards, they were trained in clinical space with patients, with doctors working together. And at the end of the three-year training, they had a national exit exam to, co to make sure the competency is there to, for them to go into the, uh, the service sector. Okay. Just quickly, scope of practice, as you can see, whatever is done in a district hospital, it is listed there in the scope of practice. So I'm not going to go 
into that. Uh, but we, I'll just pick up one or two issues which still has some confusion among us. Scope of practice in prescribing. Like sometimes people will, ah, they need to, somebody has to countersign. The clinical associate, as, as according to the scope of practice, they can actually prescribe up to essential drug list, primary health care, up to level four. And then they don't need a, a counter signature for that. They need to write the name of the doctor who is supervising. And then if there is an emergency, they can actually prescribe higher levels and then it will be signed, especially in, in, an, uh, in a critical patients. And any drugs which are not on the EDL for primary health care signed off uh, by a, a doctor. But we need to take it in association with the next point I want to take is the supervision. One of the sort of worry people have is like we employ a clinical associate, they need to be supervised and it's, 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 it's not going to yield much. But remember that the scope of practice is very clear. The first two years when they work as clinical associate, they need to be supervised. They, so that means it's a hands-on supervision. They work with the doctor, right? But the scope of practice also says if a clinical associate is competent, the doctor may delegate any duty to the person. So as a clinical associate is working with the doctor for two years, after a few months, they are able to actually do a lot of things in the same consulting room or with the doctor. And from once they have two to four years of continuous working as a clinical associate experience, then they need they don't need to have a doctor next to them. They can, and after four years, actually, they can work provided there is somebody physically or telephonically available if there is a need. I think this is something we need to really, really look at. Because as I said, we have 11 cohorts of Colgan Associate with us. So the first seven cohorts are now in that space. They can actually run OPD, which I'm sure I see lots of people are nodding. You know, in the district hospital, when you are really short, your queue is long, your mamas have come from far away from the rural areas and they have to get back. You can't ask them to go and come tomorrow. It's God sent clinical associates, people actually. If there's a problem, they pick up the phone and say, Dr. So-and-so, like there's a patient. So that person is going to be seen by the doctor if he is busy in casualty or in theater or so on in maternity. I think this is somewhere we are not really doing it very well. Just quickly, where are they? They are in public sector and private sector. And uh, let me quickly go on. In public sector, they have been working in outpatient, inpatient, emergency department, community-based outreach and services, and COVID-19. I'll probably pick up one or two things to, oh. These are places currently clinical associates are working in. TB clinic, for example. I, I know in some of the district hospitals, we have few doctors and then consults come and go. When community service doctors come, they know they are there for one year and they are leaving. The difference in a clinical associate, when you train and develop a clinical associate, that person is permanent there. You are establishing skills and a person confidence to manage it for next some years to come. HIV clinics, as we said, we run the biggest heart program in the world. And what we need is continuity. Yes, we need doctors, but while we all know all the hospitals, they can't recruit doctors in the further from Bulworth Food or Kentucky, the lesser doctors are there. And that's where we need to make sure that we make use of this uh, clinical health associate so that we provide service, the hands. Emergency department, I know many of you agree with me, in the district hospital, there are times there is a critical patient brought to emergency, the doctor is in the theater. By the time you look for somebody else, 
the patient is going to wait. Yes, the nurses do the initial work, but remember, so the, somebody needs to clinically assess, make a diagnosis, start treatment. Clinical associates can do that, even if it is the higher level drugs they are allowed to prescribe and resuscitation, they are able to resuscitate. So they are trained in all these things. Inpatient, just briefly, they work in all these areas, like people will agree with me in the district hospital. This is where they work. They admit discharge, they do rounds, even if the doctor is not there, they do rounds, and if there is a critical problem, they may call, but otherwise they do rounds, they order investigation, they follow the investigation, get the results, make changes in the treatment, and so on. And uh, obviously maternity, delivering babies, and uh, they do MBAs and, and, and the rest of it. So the ward work actually can be, the doctor can share some of the responsibilities, and some responsibilities actually can be done instead of the doctor by the clinical associate, especially as they go into that four year and above. I just want to spend one minute in COVID-19. I think this is an interesting place because all of us, doctors, nurses, clinical associates, we learn about COVID-19 at the same time. So we cannot claim to be experts in COVID-19. And in, in fact, if you look at it, starting from screening, testing, home visits, outpatient care, health education, vaccination, COVID ward management, emergency care for those critically ill patient brought in, they were there, they are there. And for the next pandemic, whatever the nature of it, they will be there. Because we had some of the most remote hospitals and facilities had these clinical associates with us, we were able to survive during that time, manage our patient, give the best to our patients. The private sector used clinical associates, especially in the mines, to go and visit homes of the uh, employ uh, mine workers and their families, test them and follow them up if they are positive for 14 days. So there was a lot of contribution done there as well. Again, primary health care, understandably, all the outreach work as well as clinic and community health work, they were part of it. What can they do procedure-wise? Like sometimes we, when we don't know, we don't know. In a study published, uh, uh, done I think in 2016, recently published, this is the list of co common procedures done by a clinical associate in the study. As you can see, as a doctor, if you know, if you need to do a lumbar puncture or put up a chest strain, it's going to take you time. The taking blood, drawing blood, suturing, some of the time I know the nursing colleagues help us in there, but it's not necessarily their job description. They are sacrificing some other work to do that. Here they were able to do. I marked the circumcision because there is a, a lot of circumcision work done by clinical associates in the last few years. And there's a paper published which actually analyzed the performance of the clinical associate by, with the doctors. And they have done equally in terms of complication to measure their performance is equal or sometimes better. And they did it in actually shorter time. Understandably, if somebody is doing circumcision one after the other every day, they can do better than doctors. It's a skill. It is mechanical. Once you are skillful, you can actually perform better than a doctor who does infrequently that same procedure. Private sector, I think currently these are the places clinical associates are employed and the employment numbers are growing up very fast. I think the interesting portion is that currently there's a lot of uh, private work going on in digital, like uh, technology with medicine and where they need clinician to interlink the technology and the, uh, the, the patient. They are employing clinical associates to do that. Professional development, again, uh, we have not developed, have enough, clinical postgraduate training for uh, clinical associates yet. There's only one clinical, which is emergency medicine. The others are generic, public health, academic, uh, uh, um, health professions, education, and, uh, and so on. So that's an area where there is, it's a big uh, uh, a shot 
coming in that profession. I think the responsibility is from the academics and the uh, Department of Health. So people are now taking uh, another route to clinical health profession. A, a good number of clinical associates are slowly moving into studying medicine, studying dental. Um, and the others, as I said, like the previous. So a study up to the, looked at up to 2017, it's only about 47% of the graduates are in the public sector in the government. And then private, 21. But in 2015, it was 2%. So it is growing very fast, private sector hiring clinical associate. And uh, as you can see, we are the, uh, the rest of us. So just quickly look at what have they offered. They provided in the primary health care at all different areas, provided the health, health um, system with emergency medical care, clinical work, and they worked as good team players. They expressed their desire to work in uh, rural areas. And uh, I think that the study, it was uh, about 55% who actually want to go when they are doing studying clinical associate. I think we need to look at the, the uh, then the last study when we looked at the medical student, it's 4%. So when medical students are in medical school, they know only 4% are looking to go to rural areas compared to this group. And one of the things I want to just quickly to continuity of care, as I mentioned earlier, if you are going to strengthen primary health care in the district hospital, community health centers, in the district health system, we need continuity. We need continuity because as continuity expands with additional personnel, it becomes more in easier for the doctors who are there to continue to be there. People leave rural hospitals, rural sector, because they are burned out after a while. You are very few always chasing things. So we need these additional hands so that they can actually flourish and they can con consider staying there for longer. Cost effectiveness is a big thing we talked about. There is a, a recent publication of a systematic review internationally. And then they looked at not actually cost of care only, but they looked at quality of care and accessibility of care of the clinical associate in providing health services in the systems. And um, it, they have looked at patient outcome, process outcomes, and care provider. And out of all these, it, they have proven that uh, the studies actually support the clinical associate uh, uh, cost effect. In South Africa, to employ clinical associate, we can employ 2.3 people instead of a doctor. So if you have a vacant doctor post, if you employ two people, two clinical associates, you increase the number of clinicians, make life easy. Just one quickly, recipe for the success of stories. Of successful stories happens when these are provided in the facilities. And these are provided by the other health workers, doctors, nurses, managers. We all need to nurture, mentor, support, and uh, allow them to develop leadership, recognize their contribution, appreciate their contribution, respect them for their value, and trust them that they can do good things. So the challenges, I think some of them we have looked at, the number production number, I think the recently the, it was published by uh, the uh, task team, uh, national task team for clinical associates report of 2017, which was done by a collaboration with all the stakeholders for the Department of Health. It showed very clearly that for us to achieve the uh, uh, 2030 NHI and in the primary health care setup and the district system, they have shown a very extensive calculation to say the country needs about 11,500 clinical associates. We need to produce, we are at the moment producing 150 a year. You can do the mathematics, which is not going to allow us to reach our goal. The career path, 
you are still in the system. There is no progression horizontally or vertically in a clear way. But at the moment, currently, the National Department of Health is talking to the, uh, uh, the stakeholders to, to finalize all this. So hopefully, it will sort itself out. And lack of CPD activities. Doctors and nurses get opportunities, not clinical associates. I must say, uh, the Eastern Cape Province last year has started uh, with the Department of Family Medicine from WSTO to train or upskill uh, training shops, training workshops for clinical associates to, to improve on that. Um, so, what to be done? We need to scale up production. We need to have enough funded posts to appoint clinical associate. We should sort out the career opportunities in terms of their growth and their prospect for life. Otherwise, they will be moving out either into the private sector or into other, other profession. And uh, that includes the postgraduate training. And support at the appropriate facilities. And once you support the first group of clinical associate in a facility, remember the people who come after that, actually they thrive better. They thrive better because they have seen somebody who is being supported. And then we, uh, doctors, nurses, we need to look at task shifting, task sharing, and we must understand what does the scope of practice of the clinical associate so that we are able to work with them as a team and make better outcome for the patients in our uh, setup. Understanding what is what can be done by clinical associate by all other health workers, it's a very important aspect of getting this profession to contribute the full potential to the health system. Advocacy for the profession. I think any new profession, when they start, they are few. They are young in the professional sector. They are not in the OST cluster yet. So the rest of health workers, especially those of us who are passionate about uh, rural health, we must advocate, we must join hands and to advocate for this clinical associate so that at the end of the day, we can provide what we are wishing and wanting to deliver to our communities far away from the big cities. We must see this as a social investment. So in conclusion, at the moment, as a country, we are not really optimizing the contribution this profession can make to the health system. If we are serious in really providing primary health care to every person who is in the lollies, we really need to work on ourselves first as health workers, support, encourage, mentor. As if you are managers, give them confidence, trust them, respect them, and delegate, share, task shifting. There are lots of things we can do as individuals. And there we develop advocacy for this profession. And then we can say, yes, there's a good chance by 2030, every South African will good health care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yogi. Well, you couldn't get it much clearer than that, could you? Uh, you really set it up very comprehensively. Um, unfortunately, with keynote speakers, we, we don't normally budget for a discussion or a Q&A uh, session, but I'd love to get a debate going, you know, between the Western Cape Department of Health and the... <laughs> Like, um, where is this going, and and how do we how do we uh, um, address the challenge of career progression, etc.? Um, so that's for tea, over tea, and uh, throughout the course of the of the rest of the conference, I do need to give the last five minutes of the session to um, Herman, who's waving his hand at me, with uh, with all the logistics that follow. Um, uh, for the rest of the day, and in fact, the next couple of days. And, and just to say that uh, Hammond has single-handedly pretty much put the program together. And I really want to acknowledge that 
the amount of work that goes into a coordinating a hybrid conference like this with all the IT and all the various uh, different parts. Um, please welcome Herman to the stage. Okay, thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And it looks like the best conference I've ever been to. <laughs> I wasn't in the plenary, so I'm not sure what Steve has already said. <laughs> but are you aware that this is our 25th anniversary of conferences? Um, I'll quickly talk about a few logistical things. Um, we'll serve tea outside here. You want to sit in the garden. There will be a dance group performing for you. Um, it's from Kapadim School. Uh, they're a school for people with disabilities in George. They struggled a lot to maintain themselves through COVID. So desperate for sponsors. I don't know if they brought their sponsor sheets, but they usually got sponsor sheets where you can adopt a child. So they're coming here for free. But I promised them that I would just mention it, that if, one, if somebody wants to adopt one of their children, you're welcome to do so. Um, at T, at, so there's um, main things, but for people who are gluten intolerant or lactose intolerant, you've got special milk for you. We've got special cookies for you. So the others, please don't grab from them, only if you actually need them. Um, same for lunch. Uh, some people have special diets, uh, vegan, vegetarian, halal, and so on. They will be separated from the main meal. If you see that, that actually, you know, the grass is always green on the other side. <laughs> Please let the ones who've ordered the special diets help themselves first. If there's leftover because you made a few extra portions, then you can join them. But don't grab it if you haven't ordered it, please. In terms of the sessions, you've all got the program in front of you. So for the morning session, after this we'll have tea, then we'll break into three venues. This is venue number A, the main hall. If you walk up past the swimming pool, there's a little um, veranda with a, a roof tent. If you go through there, you get to venue number B, the restaurant. And on your right hand side there, there's a chapel or capel uh, where you can get married <laughs> or you can attend the session there. The session there will be a clinical session, uh, SONA training. And the SONA equipment was kindly um, brought to us, sponsored to us by Respiratory Care Africa. So they haven't taken a table here because their display is actually the SONA machines. And they will stay there the whole of today and the whole of tomorrow. So you can go there anytime during tea time in the afternoon and practice your SONA skills. They are there to be there and just help you. Uh, but if you want to learn something, then you must attend the session after tea. And Johan has organized that. He will be the chairperson of that session. At the same time, Jürgens is doing a transdisciplinary emergency care session. And because there's SONA can't house so many people, we split the sessions into two. So you will be one. So if you go to that session, you all meet at the chapel. But then there we will meet you into some do the SONA and some do the other. And then after an hour, they flip around. It might be confusing, but Johan will manage that very well. In the restaurant, the session um, is on coverage. And that's basically more sessions offered by clinical associates. You've heard now of the value of clinical associates. There's a session on circumcisions that clinical associates do in the Western Cape and so forth. And there's also some talks on keeping healthcare workers in the rural health force. And then in this hall, you will have a session on COVID, venue A. And that's actually the theme of our conference. So we've given them the 
spotlight here in this main hall. Um, and that will be shared by Tabisa. That's for the sessions. After that, we'll have lunch. And I'm hoping that we get blessed over lunch by something that comes from the heavens. And it's not rain, but it's something that we really appreciate when it comes to our hospitals. And I won't tell you what that surprise is. In the afternoon, we'll break the conference into four parallel, uh, into five parallel streams. So we will use the same three venues, plus two venues that are in the community. And we don't want you all to drive with, with your cars. We've organized mini bus taxis. They will be parked down here. And once we see how many people are going to each of those sessions, we'll put you into a car and the car will take you there. And it's kind of in the theme of being rural, uh, you know, troubleshooting, doing with the equipment that you have, and getting to know each other on the bus, you know, see who's with you on the bus and talk to them and use that as part of the session. Don't see that as, you know, you're on a bus and use that as part of mingling and networking and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's always 15 minutes before we meet there. I'll try to at lunch, uh, at, um, lunch just ask people, those that go to the satellite, please leave. We meet here. And then we've got 10 minutes to get to the sessions. And when you're done, the same transport will bring you back. I think that's enough announcements. Toilets are here. Swimming pool is here. Wi Fi. Wi Fi. <laughs> at our booth, at the entrance, there's two plaques on the side with two passwords. And one of them should be working. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, we've had ex problems this morning, so I'm trying to contact the Wi Fi support team to help us. So bear with us, we don't get it now, but we will sort it out during the day. Thanks for that reminder. Um, some of you came in here without signing the CPD register. So at the exit, that side, not here where the T is, at that side. If you haven't signed in, please put your name onto that list. And every session that you go to, you must sign in for CPD points again, please. On the program, you will see some sessions are marked with a star um, where there's ethics points. And so if you're keen for ethics points, then you can kind of quickly be guided to those sessions. But the other sessions will be just as valuable in terms of learning content and so forth. Is there any questions from the floor? Short questions that involve everybody. Is it just small things you can talk to me after the session during tea? What I want you to do is if you do a session, like after tea, you might be in this venue. Please come with your memory stick, go to the IT test, uh, desk and give them your talk to load onto the conference computer. And that counts for all the venues. Use the tea time before your session, not when the session starts come and because then the session needs to start. So please make sure either the morning of the day or during that first tea time, go there and load your session so that it's on the computer there. If you've got so much on your own computer and you say you'd rather use your own laptop, that that is okay, but you must just let the AV person know that I am here but I want to use my own computer, my own laptop. So that is an option. And we were told we can use Apple and Microsoft. They can connect both of them. Um, last point. I wanted to give some books to the plenary speakers. And I couldn't listen to your session, so I'm hoping I'm giving them correctly. 
But to the mayor, I wanted to give this one. This is going to hurt. <laughs> That is about a doctor in the UK who stopped being a doctor and became a comedian. <laughs> and it's a very funny book. Please buy it. To Lizette, I wanted to give in our own words an account of nurses facing the COVID epidemic. To Mayara, I hope you don't have this book yet. It's written by Ben Gord about the Tulela Hospital. And for Yogi, I couldn't make up my mind, so I've got so many here. <laughs> um, but I thought I'd give you Saving a Stranger's Life, uh, doctors' accounts of the experience of COVID. And with that, I let you go to have tea. Enjoy it. You don't need to say anything. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, surprised that you don't have my bio sketch. <laughs> Uh, it was uh, uh, it was given uh, during the registration. But anyway, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity, and uh, it's for me an honor and privilege to be here today presenting uh, in the rural health conference. This is my rural, my first rural health uh, participation. I'm uh, Jose Beuruma. I'm a medical doctor by training originally from Congo DRC, but I've been working in KwaZulu Natal for the past uh, years. I've been working uh, in uh, one of uh, the regional hospital, which is a hospital where I work in the family medicine department for six years. And then after that, I moved to Africa Health Research Institute where I'm actually working as a research physician. So today I'll be talking, I'll be sharing with you some of our experience when we were trying to recruit participants in the beginning of the pandemic. So this is the outline of my presentation. So a bit of background. Um, I think some people, they know Africa Health, uh, Africa Center for Health, Population studies that is based in KwaZulu Natal in Mkanyakude in a very rural area that has been merged with uh, KwaZulu Natal Research Institute for TB and HIV Carries, which is based in Durban. So, those two institutes they came together to form what is called now Africa Health Research Institute. So, the Africa Health Research Institute has two uh, campuses, as I said, one based in, uh, in Durban where most of the basic science are done, the lab uh, studies and uh, some medical experimental study are taking place. The Durban campus has also a, a biosafety uh, level three lab. And uh, the rural area up north, the northern KwaZulu Natal, is where most of the population-based studies are happening and some of the uh, clinical and interventional studies are happening. So in the beginning of the COVID-19, as you know, everybody was in a race to find some answers uh, to many questions. And KwaZulu Natal, as you know, is one of the provinces which has the highest, uh, which carries uh, the largest burden of uh, HIV and uh, the related uh, disease. With, uh, HIV and TB co-infection rate, which are around 70%. So there were questions about COVID and HIV. What are the effects of uh, HIV and TB on the COVID infection? So I'm not, uh, sorry. Uh,
So I'm not really going to dwell too much on the basics of the COVID itself, but I'm just giving you a background how this study came about. So there were questions like uh, the COVID infection and immune dynamics in the population with high prevalence of TB and HIV was part unknown. So there was a need to understand what is the COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 viral dynamics and what are the host response and household transmission pattern in the population where there is a lot of TB and HIV. Because this was very important information that needed to be addressed to inform the public health response to this pandemic within KwaZulu-Natal and as well within the South uh, uh, Sub-Saharan uh, region. And going further, the question was to know if uh, patients who are HIV positive have another cause of uh, COVID disease compared to those who are HIV negative. And uh, looking at those who are HIV positive on ARVs, if they are suppressed or if they are not suppressed or they are failing the regimen compared to those who are HIV negative. And also to look also if people who have TB or even previous uh, lung damages, if they, they are predisposed to do more severe uh, forms of COVID. So those questions they were asked and then it was really necessary to answer them. So there was now the study has been proposed to see how the, these questions can be answered. So the title of the study was the consequences of HIV and TB co-infection on COVID disease dynamics, severity and human response. So in, in the short uh, name of the study was mechanism study. And uh, the participant here was all the confirmed cases and the household contacts of confirmed cases in the Africa Health uh, Research Institute demography surveillance area. I will talk a bit about more about the Africa Health Research demographic surveillance area when we'll be talking about the setting. And then we were planning that we will recruit at least 60 cases. And then with uh, the data from the Africa, our demographic surveillance uh, uh, team, we knew that uh, most of the household, they had at least plus minus four uh, members. So we are planning to recruit around 300 household contact. And then the study actually was that we administer symptom questionnaire and uh, also take the health history and collecting of samples, which were blood, uh, the sputum, and uh, the drugs. The study was planned to last for one year, but unfortunately, uh, the study uh, May 2021. So the objective of the study, as I said in the beginning, it was to establish the relative SARS-CoV-2 infectiveness, the viral clan clearance dynamics and impact of antiretroviral therapy in HIV positive versus the HIV negative. So the study wanted to answer those questions to see uh, if HIV positive patients, they have more severe uh, clinical presentations. If the study, if they are sick, if uh, the course of the disease is much longer or if they take longer, uh, having the, the virus shedding. And also to understand what was happening within uh, the community where TB and HIV is quite prevalent. So these are our setting in KwaZulu Natal, uh, in Kanyakude. So it's quite very rural. It's a very poor, very very poor uh, rural uh, setting, where most of the more than eighty percent of uh, young people are, are unemployed. The HIV and TB prevalence is quite high, and. Uh, Africa, during the Africa Center for Health and Population Studies, they have been in the place for many years, for more than 20 years, where they've been collecting uh, some of the demographics and health information about the participants around the area. So with all those data, so we know where people, they live, we have an idea about the burden of the disease, and uh, we know also, uh, a way to find the participant.
anyways. So with uh, our demographic surveillance team, where they where usually do the surveillance every four months, they will be calling the, the, uh, the, the people in the community to update the information in terms of the number of people are leaving the household, if uh, people have moved from the household, and they have been updating that. But during COVID, what they decided to do, when they were doing that uh, telephonic communication, they were also asking people about the COVID symptoms. So those who presented, who, was, who answered that had one of the COVID symptoms, like cough, fever, short throat, all those symptoms that we know, the Africa Health, our team, was has gone to visit them at home with a mobile clinic where sample um, the COVID swab uh, was taken. So. But that was called the ARI surveillance study, that was the uh, ARI surveillance study. So those participants that were positive during the ARI surveillance study, these are the participants that we also in our study will be enrolling. We did not want to enroll everybody because remember, as I said, we have already data of most of the participants around the area. So it was easy for us to get even more information afterwards when we enroll participants who are already known uh, within uh, our area, instead of just recruiting anybody who come maybe from a private hospital with a positive uh, COVID test. So we only enrolled those participants that were coming from the ARI surveillance study. And uh, the inclusion criteria was quite straightforward. So it was all ages, both sex, but you should have your COVID test that has been done positive uh, within the previous week. And uh, we administer the informed consent and consent for those who are below 18 of age. And then we assess that you are likely to adhere to the standard procedure. And uh, those who qualify for, for, for the study were divided in two groups, as we said the positive COVID cases and the household. Now, I just want to remind you that, as I said in the beginning, we have two campuses. So the positive cases, because the study was happening uh, similar, uh, at the same time in our site in, uh, in, in some Kele and as well in Durban. So in Durban, there was many, there were many uh, patients were uh, hospitalized within some of the institutions that were uh, selected as sites. So we had like Albert Lutuli Hospital, King Edward Hospital, King Dinizulu, where all the hospitalized positive COVID cases were uh, approached for the study. But uh, in our site, uh, in the uh, some kind of area we had of the COVID cases that are positive within the community that we are enrolling. So I'll be talking more about those in the community and also their household contacts as well. And there was supposed to be follow up the positive cases to be follow up and day one, day seven, day fourteen, and uh, day twenty-eight, and then after six months. So they have five time points for follow up. And for the contact cases, they were supposed to be follow up on uh, enrollment day one and day 14. And there were different type of uh, samples that were collected, like blood, the swabs, the sputum, and also clinical and demographic data. So just to give you an idea what was happening, so we plan to enroll 60 participants and their household contacts, as we said, with those different time points. And then from the baseline, as you can see, in total, there was around uh, 35 mils of blood. So we had a very extensive counseling of the participants to make them understand why we are doing this study and what will take and to lay the anxiety in terms of the amount of blood that will need to be collected to answer some of the questions, mainly from the main study, which was done uh, in, in our Durban uh, sites. So these are the different type of samples that have been collected. So the contacts, they were only seen at day one and day 14, but at day one, we were collecting bloods and uh, sputum, and uh, we, we were doing also the, the COVID swap. And day 14, we're not doing the sputum, but we're doing blood and the COVID swap. So now, what was our experience? As you can see, the numbers were low. Why they were low, I'll explain to you as we, 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 we carry on. We had 
seven cases that were invited into our study who met the criteria, as we said, they should be COVID test positive within the previous one week. And also, there was another uh, thing that uh, we were only recruiting participants that were less than 10 days prior to the consent of symptoms. So those were above 10, uh, more than 10 days of the uh, onset of the symptom, they were not uh, enrolled. So we had seven uh, cases that were invited, and among those seven cases, we had 42%, 42.8% females, and the age was ranging between 26 and 65, and we had about 28.5 were HIV positive. And among those ones, according to the report from uh, the, the demographic surveillance, we had about 34 household contacts that were supposed to be uh, uh, enrolled at that time, with a median age of 17. The main, the, main reason, the main reason of my talk is about those challenges that we experienced because at the end of the day, because of the turnaround and the numbers, the study was stopped. But I wanted just to highlight some of the challenges that we experienced while we we're trying to recruit this participant. Although the study in Durban still continue and from the findings from the Durban study, I think many people have heard about the findings uh, that's contributed into how to understand how COVID is working in HIV infected and then even to inform in terms of the different variants and as well even in terms of the vaccine efficacy. So in our uh, campus, we had operational uh, challenges like uh, as I said, the study were only we were only recruiting participants that were identified by our demographic surveillance uh, st uh, area uh, study. So we're not recruiting other participants. So that was uh, one of the limitations in terms of reducing the number of participants that could actually be recruited. And also in the beginning, although the frontline workers at ARI, the staff, they were priority we had what we call the risk assessment. So we're checking if you are HIV positive, if you have comorbidity, you should not go and work with uh, COVID participants. So and all the, the necessary equipment and protection equipment that were given to the, part, uh, to the staff. But despite that, we had some staff who got sick. And because of that, the study had to be put on hold. So this also delay even the process. We had issues, as you know, in the rural area, we had issued the network where, because what was happening when the participant is tested positive from the, the RA surveillance study, they will be informed that, look, there's another study that you need to participate to. And the participant would give consent and then we'll go and uh, uh, enroll the participant. But sometimes for follow up, they, they were issued the network. And sometimes even the alternative numbers were not working. So it was quite difficult because we have to make a booking and inform the participant that the team is coming to your home for the follow-up. And sometimes you will come and you don't find the participant because he has forgotten about the appointment, even though it was a short uh, period of time. We are following them every week. And uh, the issue about the road network, we have most of the roads 
uh, covered roads that we have to, to, to drive through. And uh, the issue when it's rain, sometimes it becomes difficult and it's not safe even for the team to go out to see uh, the participant. Although uh, the uh, Africa, uh, Africa Health Research Institute Demographic Surveillance had a mapping of participants and people where you can find them, but you know they have a designated team of field workers who know where they find the participant. But with us, there was a different team that we needed to work with to go and find participants. As you know, in the rural area, you don't have proper addresses. You have to go, maybe they'll give you a, a something like uh, my home is close to the clinic, close to the school, close to a spaza shop, you know, and people have to go and find those places. And then now uh, from there, you can uh, tell yourself the houses may be a few meters or a few miles away from the, the area. So that was also an issue. Sometimes people will go and get lost. They have to ask around before they can find the, the, the participant. And also, the issue about the schedule of activity in December, uh, Africa Health Research Institute usually shut down after the 18th, and then we resume the activity in the beginning of the year. So there were some participants during the follow-up of the one-week visit that they were falling during that time. So it was a challenge in terms of operation because everybody's gone, and uh, we could not go and uh, follow them according to the schedule. And also, the household. Uh, contact despite the fact that they were in contact with a positive case but when you come to the household uh, to the homes they were not around some they were going there to work some they were at school at the time when we we're coming to their home so that makes it also difficult to get more people and also sorry another issue was the study burdens because they were already involved in the RS surveillance study now they have to get involved in our study so some they were not keen especially when they knew that they still need to provide samples as well so some they were not keen even though a proper informed concept was administered to them so some of the participant related challenges was mainly the stigma and the non-disclosure in the beginning because people were not well informed and the myth around the COVID. So some people are thinking that uh, if they disclose, they inform the family, they'll be isolated. And uh, that was really a problem with them. So they, would, they didn't want to disclose. And we had participants also, they were denying the COVID test result. They will say, but I'm not, I'm not having any symptoms, you know, the misinformation. So with time, people got more educated and they were talking about COVID most of the time, even if you are symptomatic, but you can still be positive. So it made things easier. But in the beginning, it was still not easy to make some other people to understand. We had cases by uh, the daughter or the son of uh, an uh, uh, elderly participant will come and challenge us. How come our mother, who doesn't walk around, only stays in the house, how come that is COVID positive? Forgetting that even people, younger people are going outside, they could easily infect uh, the granny who has been staying at home. So, and because of that, they will refuse to give the consent and or maybe they will stop us to proceed with uh, the, the study. So it was not easy. As we were saying, family members sometimes uh, and relative opposing the informed consent given by any daddy participant, they will say no, the elderly participant can just accept everything. But while we know that the elderly participants have a mind that is sound and can understand because the informed consent was administered in Isizulu. So they took time to spend with the participant at least one hour where they're going to engage with the participant. But still, it was a challenge. And then we had family members who have to stop us to say, no, you cannot proceed because it's like uh, you just want to use uh, uh, my parents for your study, you know? And the adherence to the study procedures, especially with the household uh, contacts, because as I said, at day 14, we still needed to collect the swab. And some, they will still not understand why we have to collect the swab at uh, day 14, because we're looking at the things like uh, the viral shadings, all those things. But because of that, they will not accept. They will say, no, you just have to do the blood, but you cannot do the swab. But you cannot 
the, one of the conditions was that you must comply to the procedure because there are questions that need to be answered and those samples are purpose for that. So that was another challenge as well. And as I said about the isolation, it was a challenge in most of the households. And the study also was involving the children. So there was no limitation, as I said, even the children were supposed to be involved in the study, but parents, they were refusing to give consent, especially for children that were below five in terms of the bloods and awareness program to better adhere to the public health regulations. Before the beginning of the study, we have our community uh, advisory boards that all the study have to go through them. You present the study, if they are happy, then they approve because they are the people that they engage and interact with the community as well. But we have also other ways where we do interact with the community, like we do road shows uh, where we go and speak to the community. But during COVID time with the restriction, it was a bit difficult. And uh, in the beginning, what we've noticed that people like the some of the community leaders, like uh, uh, traditional healer, they were not well uh, uh, educated about this because you know in the rural area most of the people when they have COVID, uh, when they are sick some people they don't just come straight to the health facility they go first to the traditional healer but the traditional healer were not well trained or informed they could also maybe assist in informing and also making people aware about covid so that was one of the shortfall and uh, there was a need for additional research to better understand what are the barriers to the adherence to COVID public health uh, guidance at that time. So I want to just thank the team of uh, Prof. Alex Seagal, who was the PI of the study, and uh, Emily Wong, who, who is the co-PI of the study. They're all the ARI uh, faculty. and. Uh, my, my, the nurses and uh, the clinical research assistant that we work with and also the partners uh, that we work with because this study was where, uh, with uh, Caprisa, the South Africa Medical Research Council, uh, HSR, the Pazul University of Pazul Natal, Chris, where they were doing the sequencing of the of the, 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 the virus and ourselves at ARI. Thank you. Wow, uh, can we repeat that? I didn't hear it. Thank you so much, my man. I hope you have forgiven me for not having your bio. I'm having it now. So we, me and you, we are cool now. Ne? Okay, we would like to welcome the questions and comments while the guy is still here. Thank you. I think we are having a, a roving mic. Do we have questions? Mm. 
not having questions might mean that here, yeah, there's one. There's one here, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for a nice presentation. I just want to know, I see that you mentioned one of your challenges uh, being unable to find the households due to addresses, etc. Did you at any point consider working with the community health workers or the teams from the Department of Health in the area? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, the Department of Health is one of our stakeholders and we need approval from the Department of Health before we can do the run the study. So we, when we, we had this challenge, we also have been interacting with them and then they were saying they will see how they can assist us because it was really a concern. Remember, the one of the reasons was to see the transmission pattern of COVID within the community. And it is one of the concerns that this house of contact, even if they are with someone that is confirmed COVID, but they are not staying around, what can the Department of Health can do to improve or to bring awareness, you know? And then this is something that they promised they can do. But during that time, as you can see, our study only lasted for, if I'm not from uh, September to May. And later on, they came on board, but around the time that we're trying to recruit, they did not really help us much. So we did not really seek help from the, the community healthcare workers because we went back and discussed our, our uh, demographic surveillance team because they asked them some field workers where we're having some engaging engagement with them to see how they can assist us because they've been doing this home going around the homes for, for many years to see how uh, they can assist us to bring awareness as well. There is another question for you. Thank you. Mine is um, more of a comment, which really, I think it's a challenge. For, for all of us who are working in this industry, which is health. Thank you, Doctor, for your presentation. Uh, and at your, your last uh, uh, comment on the challenges, which really is a challenge of um, community participation that you said we had, which for me, it has, it does not only relate to the COVID era, but, but basically, but basically, how do we make sure that communities are involved in, in what we are doing? I think we are really very, very challenged uh, when, when it, comes to, it comes to that. It, 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 it's something, I don't know whether you can, you can just comment on saying, once you have challenged, once you realize that that was a challenge, is there anything that you think you ought to do moving forward? Because really community participation is a challenge to, to all of us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, that's quite a very important question. Um, you know, the difficulty during that time of COVID it was difficult to directly engage with the community. Although we had uh, the community advisory board that uh, were involved in the beginning of the study, they were informed about the study, but that was not enough. We were supposed to go extra mile. But with the restriction around, it was difficult to reach uh, the community, the schools, uh, during our roadshow, even going to a place like a tax rank. But, uh, in a normal setting, as you are saying, the community participation is very important, whereby we don't just uh, limit ourselves like uh, having the study uh, presented the community as a board, but uh, 
we need to have a continuous engagement with the community, with our other um, community leaders to see how they can assist in that sense. That is why, like uh, at Africa Health Research Institute, which uh, has launched uh, the clinical trial unit just last year uh, in March, we, we are planning to have sessions for all the studies that we are starting, where we decide having the community advisory board presented uh, with the study. We need to engage. We, we, we have uh, peer navigators within uh, our institute that we'll be also using. We train them to see if they can also go out and speak with their peers so that maybe, you know, sometimes when peers, they communicate among themselves, maybe it's much easier and better they can understand. This is one of the strategy. And beside that, as I said, things of the roadshow where we talk with them and also continuing engaging with the, some community uh, leaders, the, um, the traditional healers, and to engage with them so that they can assist us uh, in terms of uh, the, the proper community uh, engagement in whatever study that we do. Last question from me to you, my man. How do you tackle the challenge of the contacts playing high to height to reach, hard to reach, ne? like changing the cell phone numbers and changing the physical address, like the ones that are staying in the informal settlements? You know that. This time you will enroll me and I will tell you that Nkalawamas are Kelly, FA is three. But because of other issues, then I move from that venue to another area. So how do you take it that? Thank you very much. I think these uh, start even when we do the informed consent, because when we start with the informed consent is when we, we plan for the, re the retention strategy, where we engage with the participant that whenever they change the address or they change the number, they should inform us. And also beside that, every time when they come for follow-up, we also ask them for the same question to ask if they're still around the same area or they've changed or they have alternative number so that we can update into the system. So this is what we have been trying to do with the participant. Also, sometimes we have a team of uh, our CRAs who will give them a courtesy call just to check if they are fine, if they don't have any problem, and also ask those questions around if they the, 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 there's any need to update their information and details. As also I said, within the Hari demographic surveillance, every four months, they also make call where they also update the system to know if someone has changed the address or the location or the number. So these are the things that we have put in place. But also, we have a toll-free number that we give to a participant that they should contact us. But sometimes it's not always easy that they have to come to us. We give them ways. They can even send like a please call where we can call them back because there are people there and then we give them a toll-free number where they can call. You get some that can contact you to give you the updates, but unfortunately some is only when they come to you, then when you ask those questions, then, then they'll tell you. So I think it's also a matter of continuing educating participants about the importance of having those details updated. any itching, 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 banning issue. Okay. Thank you very much, my man. You are now free. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Crystal, my man, I'm relying on you to inform me whether our presenters have pitched up so, if not, we will be moving uh, to the ones that are available. Uh, I'm privileged and honored to present and introduce 
a guy. He is married with a grandson. He has a daughter-in-law. He is a professor. He is a founder member of Rudasa. We are so privileged to have that kind of guy. He is currently a director of the Uganda Center for Rural Health in the Department of Global Health. Uh, he is in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences in Stellenbosch University since 2016. That man serves on the Wunka Rural Working Party and is the African section editor of the Rural and Remote Health Journal. That man is none other than Professor Ian Cooper. He is going to take us to, through to rural doctors' early experience of coping with the emerging COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Prof. Thank you. It feels more and more like I'm at a wedding as, uh, <laughs> as things move along. Happy spring day. Uh, it's certainly warming up and it's easy to get drowsy. So I want to suggest everyone stands up, turns around slowly so you don't get any hotter. 360 degrees around and sit down again. Okay, so uh, I'm presenting on behalf of a team, as you can see, and it's been a wonderful team that's an international group. Um, I always have to get up at six in the morning or uh, be there when we, when we meet because from Canada to Australia and South Africa uh, in between. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that, that team in just a moment, but uh, as we know, We've been hearing COVID has created huge challenges for all of us. Our under-resourced health systems, particularly in rural areas, are often ill-prepared. And who faces the brunt of it? It's obviously those of us working in the front line as healthcare workers. Uh, and in these kind of contexts, often with minimal resources and training um, and risk of self-exposure. And this is combined with the stress of an increased workload, risk of infection, and fear of exposing families. So people uh, felt a heightened risk um, and experienced psychological distress because of that. And particularly for those working in isolation, that was compounded by um, that experience and without having access to support and services. Now, we've done some work as a group and how we were meeting together in, in a research team before COVID came along. We looked at the issue of rural doctors' experiences of working at the limits of their scope of practice, which we've called clinical courage. Uh, and we published uh, two articles um, around that already. Um, and I just wanted to say while I'm speaking, one of the things that we really want to do is test whether this is the same for other professions. We think so, but we can't make those kind of conclusions unless we've done the work. So we actually are engaged with a group of nurses at the moment to look at this in terms of nurse practitioners, uh, but we'd love to do it in other professions as well, uh, whether this is the, the sort of rural experience for other professions. But in the case of this study I'm reporting, we actually decided to look at how Rural doctors have faced and experienced the issue of, of COVID-19 around the world. So we wanted to understand the experiences. It's very much from a constructivist uh, perspective. In other words, not assuming beforehand and building knowledge from what we found from, from the participants. Um, 
we recruited through the Wonka, you heard about Wonka Rural, Mayaro is also part of that. Um, we recruited from an international mailing list, um, seeking cohort diversity, but actually it was really from rural doctors working on the front line and wanting to make sure that we had people from across the world. Uh, because we were interviewing in English, we needed people who were proficient in English, but we wanted people who were practicing, not people who uh, like me are in an academic context uh, and people who actually had experience of managing patients. We did interviews via uh, Zoom and we divided the interviews amongst the team according to time zones and, and availability and so on. And we did those interviews in, in 2020 and really exploring participants' experiences um, of it. And then we did a thematic analysis where we had uh, a lot of fun in many ways as a group actually going through reading interviews on Zoom together and looking at themes and bringing them out. Um, and we actually presented our themes as well to the participants to get their, uh, their feedback and confirm what we had come out with. So this uh, lists the, the participants um, that we had, just to give you an idea, a range of different countries. We categorized them in terms of level of experience, early career, mid-career, um, more experienced uh, from the different income countries. Uh, um, and you can see there, there was a, a, a limited COVID testing, uh, the system was changing quickly, um, and often patients would turn up unexpectedly, uh, and their systems weren't, weren't ready for this. There was a flood of media exposure, because usually COVID had reached cities before it came to the rural areas, and, and people were hearing about it, but actually didn't know very much about it. We felt like we were constantly not knowing what was going to happen next. We did whatever we could and we kept having obstacles we hadn't anticipated. And every time we found another, we made a new plan. Uh, this is a, someone from South Africa. Steve was talking about the adaptability. So there was adaptability, but it was, you know, adaptability on steroids um, that, that they were experiencing. But regardless of that, there was a commitment to patient care. Um, my doctor said, why do you put yourself at risk? It's just the obvious thing to do. I'm mean, here's a doctor, that's my job, and of course I'm going to do that. Another doctor I actually interviewed um, from Pakistan talked about the fact that I can't do telemedicine. My patients don't have the facilities or whatever to connect. I have to be there for my patients. I'm scared, but I can't abandon my patients. Um, what was interesting, the docs talked about the fact that Initially, they didn't have enough information, and then subsequently, there was too much information coming at them. You know, I mean, every day there was another webinar and another this and another that. that, that and, but actually, their 
they had so much clinical work to do in the context. They didn't have time. And how to sift that and deal with that was another, uh, another thing for that they experienced. The second theme was around practical solutions through improvising and being resourceful. That adaptability that, that, that we, we heard about um, this morning. Um, in a number of cases in, in countries where it was slow to get to rural areas, doctors actually had time, additional time to prepare and actually set up a system. Um, someone from South Africa describing how the workshop guys were, you know, welded together, handed the sanitizer bottles and bottle holders and put them on the walls as, as they prepared. They got a security guard, trained a security guard to start screening people. Um, so those kind of resourcefulness, turning the labor ward into a COVID clinic. Um, not interviewed, but in our context, one of our learning centers.